And now from the halls of academe. <laughs> Ivan Sasha Sheehan specializes in the interse uh, intersection of global terrorism, counterterrorism, international conflict management. He came to the University of Baltimore after serving on the graduate faculty at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, in the John W. McCormick School of Public Policy. Frequent speaker on U.S. counterterrorism efforts in the war on terrorism, Sheehan has addressed diverse audiences from academic forums in Europe and at Harvard Law School, for which we will forgive you, to policymakers on Capitol Hill. His research based on terrorism incident data examines the impact of preemptive forces on the terrorist activities and the implications for U.S. foreign policy and international human security. Professor Sheehan. Good morning to you all. Dick Morris and the gentlemen on this panel uh, are difficult to ask to follow, but I, I thank you for your applause. My students uh, rarely applaud me. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be part uh, of this important pa panel at this uh, momentous time and in this very historic uh, venue. I'll begin my remarks this morning with a brief story. I was part of a panel, a round table, several weeks ago at George Mason University. And the matters on the table were similar to the issues being discussed today. The delisting of MEK, the failure to protect residents of Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty from violent political retaliation by the Iranian regime, and the growing realization on the part of a bipartisan group of senior government officials, policy analysts, and academics alike, that MEK is a valuable partner to the United States. And for too long, <laughs> and for too long, commitments to MEK have not been honored and broken promises have ensued. Now on this panel at George Mason University, I was just joined by the very distinguished uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz, uh, U.S. Attorney General Michael Mukasey, and Ambassador Lincoln Bloomfield, Jr. And over the course of our hour together, we found that we shared a, a great deal in common. All of the panelists agreed that MEK's current designation as a terrorist group was the naive result of an effort to curry favor by then President Clinton with the Iranian government, and that the designation should be challenged and ultimately overturned. All of the guests agreed that the failure to protect the refugees at Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty constitutes the worst broken promise and an injustice that must be made right. And all of the guests agreed that to use a phrase made uh, famous by President Kennedy, MEK stands on the right side of history. The right side of history. Against clerical rule, against proxy violence, against state-sponsored terrorism, and against the mistreatment of women. Because of the hard work of so many of the people in this room, MEK is increasingly viewed as a valuable and courageous voice of dissent and the primary voice of opposition to theocratic rule in Tehran. Tehran's violent ways, their dishonest diplomacy, and their ongoing pursuit of weapons of mass destruction stands in direct contrast to MEK, an organization that has renounced violence and is working to promote grassroots change in Iran so that she can someday live at peace with her neighbors. But while there's growing recognition that the Iranian opposition represents the future, 
we are currently faced with a challenge of momentous consequence. And today we stand at a crossroads. Last week, as you know, six world powers resumed discussions with Iran and Baghdad to avert a nuclear crisis. Now, while I agree with President Obama on several matters and several policy prescriptions, his decision to pursue discussions with the Iranian regime is not sensible and it is dangerous. As I wrote in an editorial this week, history suggests that diplomatic engagement with Iran is a fool's errand. There is today no cause for optimism, and there is no hope that these ongoing talks will lead to a peaceful solution to this nuclear standoff. And there are certainly no grounds for the Security Council's claims of progress through diplomacy. Iran only wants to buy more time with these talks. Consider this. After not one but two prolonged discussions, no concrete proposals from the diplomatic efforts in Istanbul or Baghdad have been realized. And a timetable for inspections of Iran's nuclear facilities has not been achieved. As the great powers now prepare for a third round of talks, this time in Moscow, we're likely to hear the same empty rhetoric, and we together must challenge it. Western officials will again downplay the prospects for an immediate breakthrough. Negotiation will be deemed a long process. Trivial concessions will be framed as political victories. And not surprisingly, Iranian officials will herald the talks as fruitful and call for continued cooperation. The result? Well, the world will be, stage will be set for more broken promises and Iran's influence will grow in a region readying itself for the inevitable power vacuum created by a smaller U.S. footprint in Afghanistan and Iraq. This, I think you'll agree, is a troubling, a troubling legacy for a U.S. president faced with the prospect of a single term. And it constitutes a blemish on an otherwise impressive foreign policy. The Obama administration's unwillingness to forcefully leverage hard and soft power to address the Iran problem underscores a combination of naivete, unwillingness to face the threat posed by Tehran, and a troubling sense that international conflicts makes for bad electoral politics. But as the talks drag on, Iran's self-appointed leaders buy precious time to pursue their ultimate goal of a nuclear arsenal. And more troubling, the world is held hostage to the posturing of a rogue regime with a long history of promoting instability and proxy violence. But it's not too late to correct these mistakes. And it's not yet too late to ensure that U.S. security interests are not jeopardized. If the Obama administration is listening, and I'm hopeful that they are, I recommend five immediate steps before the next round of negotiations commence. Number one, the U.S. should signal Iran that if negotiations fail to achieve substantive ends, the U.S. or other world powers may choose to act with force to curtail Tehran's nuclear plans. While the conventional discourse here in Washington uh, frames the options available to the U.S. government as only involving diplomatic engagement or tactical military strikes, we know that there are other options. You and I know that regime change can also take place from within. Covert action can be used to frustrate and set back Iranian nuclear plans. But support for Iranian opposition is also imperative. Nevertheless, if negotiations fail to succeed, the possible use of force and the potential for the removal of Iranian officials must be put squarely on the negotiating table. It must be clear discussions cannot and will not be used to buy time 
for the pursuit of dangerous weapons that will destabilize the region, the failure to engage in honest diplomacy will have consequences. Number two, MEK should be formally removed from the U.S. Department of State's foreign terrorist organization list and recast as the political alternative to theocratic rule in Tehran. Correcting the list to reflect existing realities in the Middle East makes clear that the instability and violence promoted by the Iranian government will be checked with support for a grassroots movement that can challenge its authority. Number three, U.S. officials should demand that International Atomic Energy Agency officials be given unfettered access to Iran's so-called peaceful nuclear program and Tehran should be made to furnish evidence of its halting of uranium to weapons grades levels. Number four, U.S. officials should step up political and economic sanctions and build support among world powers to do the same. Over the past year, existing economic sanctions have taken a toll inside Iran, and Iranians are increasingly holding their government accountable. A European oil embargo that will take effect on July 1st is a necessary means of further ripening the negotiating environment, exploiting Iran's ongoing troubles, and ensuring future compliance with negotiated concessions. And finally, number five, the U.S. must take responsibility for the protection and ultimate resettlement of refugees housed at Camp Ashraf and Camp Liberty, and you must insist that U.S. policymakers live up to their commitment and their pledges to the promotion of human rights. These measures will have, I promise you, an impact at the negotiating table. But Iran's well-earned reputation for being masters of diplomatic sleight of hand, as well as their long history of working against U.S. interests, should also be taken into consideration by U.S. negotiators in Moscow. Tehran's sophisticated use of threat and accommodation to ensure its own political interests must be seen for what it is. And the recognition that, as some in this room have suggested, no package of concessions or incentives will dissuade Iran from its current course must be considered. The window for diplomatic action is closing rapidly, and current talks in Istanbul and Baghdad have left unresolved key issues. Iranian sincerity must now be checked with calls for substantive action. The primary fountainhead of terror in the modern world cannot be allowed to hold the world hostage by raising hopes and dashing expectations only to buy time for the illicit pursuit of a nuclear stockpile. Now, while I'm doubtful that next month's talks in Moscow will result in these concrete proposals of which I speak, the talks do serve a purpose. Iranian intent is now abundantly clear, and Tehran's reputation for breaking promises and their unmistakable efforts to use negotiations as a means of buying time for nuclear armament, these things are all confirmed and they're now visible to the world. But while the situation seems grim, I'm increasingly hopeful. In your valuable work, in your determined efforts, in your courageous and sustained efforts to shift American policy in a manner consistent with U.S. vital national interests and the U.S. commitment to human rights, I see enormous promise. Your voice has helped to recast MEK as the voice of the Iranian resistance. Your voice has led to this bipartisan recognition that the existing government in Iran is an illegitimate partner 
whose commitments cannot be honored. And your voice has led to the growing recognition of the brave and honorable Iranian opposition and all that they stand for. Together we have much work to do, but if I'm confident that together, if we stand on the right side of history, our ongoing work will lead to an Iran that is at peace with her neighbors and an Iran that is a partner to the United States. Once again, it's been a privilege to join you this morning. It's been a privilege to join this distinguished panel, and I look forward to our continued work together.